The importance of fireline communications cannot be overstated. You simply cannot ignore the far too many fireline fatality investigation reports that point to poor communications as a causal factor to the accident. Over the years, the federal agencies have done their best to maintain and improve our current communication system. Keeping up with new technologies has always been a challenge. Cell phones, for example, have greatly improved communications on some levels, but we learned the hard way that vital operational information should only be transmitted over the radio so everyone can hear it. The latest technological challenge we're facing is the narrow banding of our radio frequencies. We're still in a transition period where some parts of the wildland fire community are using radios that do not have narrow band capabilities, or people with narrow band capabilities simply don't know how to use it. What this means for us is that when we find ourselves in a situation where mixed bandwidth radios are being used, this can lead to missed messages, volume control problems, and poor communications overall. To learn more about this problem and how to recognize when you have this problem and what to do with it if you do encounter it, we turn to the radio and safety professionals from the National Interagency Fire Center. Let's hear what they had to say. Well, the whole narrow banding thing, from what I've been told, started uh, when Congress mandated that uh, we divide our frequencies in half. All these frequencies that we use as federal agencies, they wanted more frequencies. There's so much going on in the world today that requires frequencies, maybe not in our VHF band, but it adds to the pool of things that require uh, an extra frequency. All the cell phones, all the PDAs, all the uh, you know, the Blackberries that are out there. Everything that is wireless communication requires a frequency. So Congress wanted more, and they're worth tons of money. Uh, somebody told us the other day, Steve Jenkins uh, from the Radio Cash said, the latest figure was that a frequency was worth $23 billion. That's a lot of money. And so there's a lot of demand for those frequencies. So they cut them in half so they could have some more. And we didn't have a choice in this. Uh, they mandated, Congress mandated that we do it, and uh, that's, how we, that's how we got to the place where we are today. So we were ordered to narrow band January 1st, 2005 when, is when we had to do it. And uh, it doubled the amount of frequencies. Does that mean that we in the fire world have twice the amount of frequencies? Not at all. They didn't give us any more. They just cut them in half and spread them out to other places. So I think it's all political demand. Who needs them worst? And we didn't uh, figure in there uh, so well, I guess. Every year we do a, an end of year report where we break the safe nets down and decide, you know, just to see where they're coming from, what they're about. And so this is where we started noticing that we're getting a lot of issues about uh, communications because 40% for the last five years of our safe nets have been communications issues. Either problems with radios, problems with repeaters, um, you know, some of them refer to narrow banding by name, although most of them are just generic radio problems. So that's how we started seeing that we had a problem with it. It's a combination of problems. If um, if you're a wideband radio operating in a primarily or narrow band environment, all the frequencies that you should be on are narrow band requirement uh, and therefore should be programmed narrow band. And if you're not in a narrow band mode and transmit into them, uh, sometimes you may be able to transmit and be received. Other times uh, you may not be heard uh, or the reception of your signal into a narrow band radio may be garbled or distorted to where you can't understand what they're saying. On the other hand, if you're a narrowband radio operating into a wideband environment, you're going to have fewer problems, but you'll have problems by low audio. That'll be the most significant um, uh, problem that you'll notice. People won't be able to hear you. Hey, you know, your batteries are low. Change them. Can't hear you very well. Um, and because of that, then uh, some of your transmissions may be missed by the wideband radio, and in some cases uh, may not be received at all. Some of the federal agencies have not made the transition 100% at this point. Uh, they've gone back and they've asked for waivers. Some of the problems are money, buying equipment, getting the equipment installed, um, don't have the people to do it. Uh, it it's a big, 
big change. It's a costly change to change all this equipment. Um, and some of them didn't, some of the agencies didn't start off in this process in uh, 1995. So they haven't taken the 10 years to do it. They've just tried to do it in the last few years for, for whatever reason. And they're not quite there. So they're still operating in a wideband mode because of equipment issues, basically. The uh, issue of federal or of cooperators that cooperate with the federal government, state, local uh, fire departments, and so forth, they uh, reside with their frequency assignments in the FCC side of the house. At this point, they are not required to be uh, narrowband. So our radio equipment is narrowband compatible. Each channel can be programmed wide or narrow. As we cooperate with that rural fire department on their local channel in the 150 band, uh, we program our radio wideband on that frequency, communicate uh, without uh, issue. If they uh, are to cooperate with us on our frequencies in our band, their radios must be narrowband capable in order to match what we're required to uh, transmit on and, and, and operate in. Um, the issue of wideband and narrowband and the appropriate use is dependent upon the frequency that you're assigned and which side of the house you, re you reside in, federal side or non-federal side. So the big key thing there is if you're on your home unit there, you make sure that, you, that there's a communication plan. Get with the local cooperators. Get with your um, cooperating agencies, federal, other federal agencies that you you share with. Get together, develop a communication plan. When it's on this land and the head agency is a state or local county agency, the, you, you may be using their frequencies. If they don't have wide or narrow band capable radios, you'd obviously, you can program your radios to be on their frequencies in the wide band mode. You can communicate. It's sitting down and making these plans and getting these, doing this pre-work so that when you get in those situations for initial attack especially, because there's been a lot of problems in the initial attack world with this issue, you've already got a plan, everybody knows where they need to go, you're not trying to do something on the fly. That's when we run into, run into problems. So pre-planning, uh, getting your plans together, your communication plans beforehand, and making sure everybody understands how that, what that plan is and how it works and when to implement it would be the key thing. To give you an example of when we'd use wideband and when we'd no use a narrowband channel or frequency on the same, in the same radio at the, on the same incident, same, same fire. Um, if you have an incident, well, let's say it's a state incident, um, and your federal entities, it's cooperative uh, response, and you've got a plan there, your channel one Channel two, channel three would be TAC channels. And uh, you work with the federal folks and the state folks possibly. And uh, those are all federal frequencies that have been designated that they should be used in the narrow band mode. So those channels one, channel two, channel three would be a narrow band channel on those frequencies, on those federal frequencies. But in order for you, your command channel might be the state repeater that's up. And that's how you're getting back to your dispatch on and at that, the state repeater is a wideband, is in the wideband mode. Um, and so on channel four, you would program channel four into the wideband mode with those frequencies. And uh, so that there in your radio, you'd have channel one, channel two, channel three in narrowband mode, channel four in the wideband mode. And so that would be an example of when you do them wideband and narrowband. And it can be done very simply, just programming it correctly. If you recognize you have a narrowband problem, the, the ideal thing to do is check your radio, check your communications plan, identify if it should be a wide band or a narrow band channel, and verify that it is, that, that, you're, that you're either wide band or narrow band based on your comm plan. Um, if that's not the case, then when you get back, you want to get it to radio folks or whoever needs to program that or repair that radio, whatever the situation, or replace that radio and get yourself a radio that will accommodate wideband, narrowband, so you can program it correctly. That's the ideal thing to do is to get it corrected and get it on the right band that you need to be.
Um, there are some things you can do based on whether you're wideband or narrowband. Um, they're quick fixes, temporary fixes. By no means are they what we'd suggest you spend the summer doing. Um, if you get into a situation where you're wideband mode and you're talking through a repeater that's narrowband, um, to get you back to camp or get you back to get your radio fixed, you may want to turn your radio slightly so that you're not, if you're a loud voice person, it, it'll help reduce how much audio, how much voice, you know, how high your voice level is into the microphone. That can help you. It's not obviously a permanent fix, but it can help you get to, until you get back in to get things repaired correctly. Um, you can just watch yourself and try to reduce your volume a little bit. Um, there are some things like that that you can do. Um, check, you know, if you're narrow band and you've got a wide band signal, just be very conscientious of that. You know, as, as you turn your volume down, make sure you turn it back up. I think the big key thing here is, as a radio user, you are you have a lot more responsibility on yourself now than you ever have before. You have to be the one to make sure you ask the questions. You know, is this a wide band or narrow band channel? Um, you know, how am I supposed to use this frequency? Who am I communicating with? Is my radio tuned correctly? Is it been maintained correctly? Um, there's a lot of these type of things that you as a radio user need to start asking uh, because we're going through some changes, some big changes right now, and we found there's been a few more problems than what we had originally anticipated as a, as a communication radio community. And uh, there's a lot of different types of radios out there. Uh, they all operate in different ways. I'm not saying they're bad, they're good, they're just different, and it's going to take a lot to get used to that. And we're going through the wideband, narrowband, and we all have to be a lot more conscientious to what we're doing out there. It's not just pick up your radio after it's been after it's been in your pack all winter, turn it on and it's going to work and you're going to talk. So there's some real responsibility upon the radio user at this point, I believe. Um, there was an FFAST team that went out this last summer that identified a lot of um, issues. And with that, an area command team came in to NIFC here and put together a good paper that identified some problems and issues and identified some, some uh, resolution or some, uh, some uh, op um, options to help alleviate some of these problems. So what we're doing at this point is uh, the annual firefighter refresher. Getting the information out during this annual firefighter refresher is a big key, and, it's, and that's one way to get people aware. And the whole thing is to, an awareness, I believe, to make people aware that there are issues and they can be resolved. And so firefighter refresher. Um, the other thing is we have a website where we've identified radios, different types of radios out there. Uh, there's programming information on those radios. This is an evolving website. There will be more out there. Um, that website address is, uh, there's no www, just radios, R-A-D-I-O-S, dot dot gov. You can download information. There's uh, tips. There's you can post some uh, notes and problems and get resolution from that, so it's a good site to go to. Uh, the third thing we're doing is we've, we're putting together a training uh, program where we'll have uh, people go out and, uh, and meet with, with the firefighters out there and, uh, and help identify some of these issues that have come up and, uh, and try to get the awareness, raise the awareness level, help these folks out, and uh, answer their questions, and provide some good training for them to help them through this next season to help eliminate some of the radio issues. For more information on radio communications and the conversion to narrowband frequencies, you can refer to the website listed in the reference section of your student workbook.